How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Fantastic. I'm so excited for today's interview. Uh, we're talking about one of my favorite topics, which is designing and writing RPGs. And we're specifically talking about non D and D. I'm not here to cast any aspersions on Dungeons and Dragons. You make up your own minds about that. But it must be said that Dungeons and Dragons gets far more attention than any other TTRPG in the space. And that I think is an injustice. So today we're going to talk about designing for other people's systems and settings like Paizo and Monty Cook, Thirsty Sword Lesbians, just to name a few, Dominique. And we're going to be talking about creating your own systems and settings, designing games from scratch that are not D&D. So, of course, I came equipped with the best possible guest. There is a, a feat in Pathfinder 2 called Prescient Packer, which means you just have what you need. And I feel like I have that with Dominique today. Dominique, they, them, is a writer, editor, con uh, cultural consultant working in RPGs and fiction. In addition to creating Trial, Plant Girl Game, and co-creating Tomorrow on Revelation 3, Dominique has written for Thirsty Sword Lesbians, Dungeons and Dragons, and Pathfinder. Their fiction has appeared in Lightspeed Magazine, Fantasy Magazine, and Nightmare, Nightmare Magazine, <laughs> among other venues. They live in the DC area, and they are always on the hunt for their next idea. Maybe it will appear here today. You can find them <laughs> over on Twitter, or you can just hang out with us right now, because we're going to have a great conversation. Dominique, <laughs> how is DC today? How has the weather been? I haven't been outside today, honestly, but okay. um, just looking at the forecast, it looks bad. We're talking high 80s, and I know for a fact it's humid out there. I will not be going outside. <laughs> Sounds like a great day to stay inside and write games. What do you say? Absolutely. Yeah, I All feel right. like um, people have this like perception of hibernating in the winter and getting things done. And I'm like, actually in the winter, I don't mind going outside. It's in the summer where I'm like, I want to hole up where there's air conditioning. And that's when I get the most writing done. That is so fair. I totally get that. I know I, I personally am a dragon, but I know that there are a lot of people who are sitting there agreeing with you, hugging the air con. So let's have a nice, a nice discussion about that. Almost so smooth. Design for non D&D systems and settings. So one of the things I like to do in these talks is uh, start from the very beginning. Where do you start? For many of our audience, that's where they're at. They're at the, oh my God, how do I even start this process? So where do you start where you're asked to uh, write or design for a game that already exists? I feel like the first thing that I want to do um, if I'm taking on a freelance job um, would be to establish familiarity with the game. And that usually looks like reading it very thoroughly, but also playing it. And if I don't have time for whatever reason to play either as a player or as a GM to think about um, what the experience would be like. So to really keep an eye on um, what kind of play style is this geared towards and what kind of GMing style is this written for? Um, what kind of person do I imagine would be like the target audience for this game? And I also um, will just ask like, is there something that already exists in the universe of content for this game that feels exemplary of what I am setting out to do? Like if I'm, you know, creating like NPCs or setting, um, setting information or um, like an adventure, I will ask um, what is, what of like what you're asking me to do, show me something that does this very well. Um, okay. And then we'll try to analyze that and see what the component parts are, right? So that might mean saying like, um, in that I also get really granular about things like that too, where I'll say like um, the the heading hierarchy in an adventure is broken down like this, where it has like background and then getting the players involved. Um, and, you know, each section has roughly this word count and try to just get a feel for what the, the basic rules of the form are. Um, and that's kind of like my, my very first thing. Yeah. Cool. Um, 
how do you seek to capture the mood and language of pre-existing settings? Because I feel like when we're talking about RPGs, there's, there's two things that are quite well established. There's the mechanic side, often called the grit, and then there's the, the writing side, often called the fluff. They're both important. <laughs> they're both, hopefully, they're working together in a lot of ways. But when you're approaching the mood and the language that might be called the fluff, how do you make sure that your own style is is appropriate? How do you make sure you're emulating what you need to emulate to make sure you're creating something that epitomizes where you're creating? Yeah, I think I'm I'm trying to think how like what is the the history of this skill? But I do think of myself as a bit of a chameleon with a uh, pro style for game design, not for fiction. For yeah. fiction, if it's me, you're gonna know it's me. But for game design, there are definitely uh, moments where I can kind of emulate someone else's rhythms or style so that whatever I'm creating blends into a larger whole. Um, I think a really solid example of this um, is I work at Montego Games in my day job, and we recently put out an RPG, Old Gods of Appalachia, which is based on the podcast, what, which sorry? has oh, Old Gods of Appalachia. Sorry. Old Gods of Appalachia. Cool. Uh, it's based on a podcast that um, has a very specific style and flow and um, a, a huge backlog of content that, you know, there's a very involved fan base. And going into thinking about the pro style of the game, we were very conscious of how do we, um, how do we emulate those, those bits that are, um, recognizable to the existing audience um, in a way that makes sense in the text-based medium. And I think for me, that really came down to um, both listening to a lot of the podcast, reading transcripts, and then as I was writing, um, trying to hear those words back in, in the voice of the show. Um, and I think that if I were, you know, writing something for Pathfinder, for example, I would start by um, just reading as much as I could and really trying to get a feel for the sound and the rhythm. And then as I write, try to um, imagine hearing what I'm writing in that same context and tweak accordingly, um, where if I, if I get to a point where I'm like, you know, my the my internal narrator when I read this existing content would not say that. <laughs> then yeah. um, that's when I'm like, oh, I should probably tweak how I'm approaching this. But I think um, having those touchstones of like what are what are common filler words, what are common sentence structures, I am. I realized that I, I have a, a pretty intuitive grasp of things like that, and I'm not sure how to translate that, but it definitely is um, little things like punctuation and word choice that can carry so much weight. And I think a lot of that just comes from like immersing yourself in existing text and then really like becoming as familiar with it as you have the, the time and the means to. And uh, as you write, um, if you don't have that kind of like internal uh, voice, I think reading it aloud also is very helpful and just trying to cross check, like, does this sound like the text that I'm trying to, to pair it with? Does it sound like it would blend? Um, yeah, I think that's like the best advice I've got. <laughs> yeah, so basically building up uh a repertoire of the idioms of the language, of the idioms of the mood, not just in language, but in, in yes. sort of thematic yeah. terms. And then really trusting that your gut knows these, has internalized these, and it will spot something that is glaringly incorrect. It will spot something that is glaringly out of place within the mood you're trying to create. Yeah, and I think it's the same part of your brain, for example, where if you're reading a book and there's dialogue that doesn't have dialogue tags when you've gotten to a point of immersion in the story where you can tell who's saying what without having it specifically tagged. I think it's um, that same like part of your brain that processes that of um, when you read something and you associate it with a certain 
uh, product or style or context, and then kind of bending what you're creating to also have that same flow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am going to answer this question for myself as well, because this is something I, I have done a few times. Yeah. Um, and my audience is very familiar with the idea of a world building meta. Um, when I have done this job in the past, so when I did this for Vast Grim, which is apocalyptic, super gross out space horror. And then I also did this for the Dark Crystal. It's a very different kind of world. Um, I actually used the meta and I used the meta as a diagnostic tool to pull out genre touchstones, theme touchstones, language touchstones that I could then go back and use essentially as a DNA document to start creating this sense of style. So every time I found something that was really, oh my God, this is, this typifies the thing, I would go and put it in the inspiration section. Every time I found something where I was like, oh wow, actually there's a, there's a really strong theme of, you know, working together brings strength, working together brings results in the Dark Crystal. That has to go in the theme section. That needs to come back in my own work because it's something that, that comes back again and again in different ways. So uh, if you are on World Anvil or if you are familiar with the world building meta, I would even go so far as to say retroact a meta for the thing. Nobody else needs to see it. It's fine. But it can be a really <laughs> useful diagnostic tool in this process to put things down, like just get them written down somewhere so it is true for you. Also, Mickey it also, uh, says, I love referring back to my meta. It's my con continuity insurance. That's what it's about. I love about. that. Yeah, that's why we do it. So we've talked about mood. We've talked about language. How do different systems and game mechanics, that's the grit side of things, affect the way you write for other people's RPGs? Yeah, I, I think that... Um different systems draw different audiences who have different play styles and are looking for different experiences. And that, I think the most tangential thing that that changes for me is how I prioritize information. Um, where if I'm looking at like a D and D GM who is very locked into GMing for 5e, and then I'm looking at, you know, someone who GMs for like cypher system products, um, but might also branch out into smaller story games. Those people are going to need information ordered in different ways. Um, yeah. Where I think I try to make sure that things come up in the order that they're most useful. Um, and it's clear what is player facing and what is GM facing. And yeah. that, that kind of strategy changes wildly depending on um, what the actual goal of the game is, which is usually reflected in the system and the mechanics. That's really cool. That's really cool. Um, do you ever find inspiration in the mechanics for, for storytelling? Yes. Um, I think that I, I try to... Um, I'm trying to think of what is a good example of this because my my answer is yes, but I'm not sure if I can think of um, like how to contextually explain that very well um, because I think there there's a there's a level to me where those things the the kind of grit versus fluff um, yes those things are equally important um, but there's also a level on which I think I I often don't actually think them as being separate things. I think yeah. um, I am not not very prone to drawing that distinction and tend to focus more holistically on like the entire piece and what that represents, which means that yes, mechanics do filter into the rest of what I'm writing because I don't see them as siloed from it. Yeah. How do you focus on the player experience when you're when you're writing? Because as a as an RPG writer, and I can tell you this for myself as well, uh, people think of the GMs as puppeteers, right? In many yeah. ways, but really they're more like cat herders. Um, so as a <laughs> as a writer, what you're doing is you're you're putting a plan in the hands of a man who is basically herding cats, or a or a, yes. or a, a person who is basically herding cats. Um, 
what are the ways that you focus on trying to make sure that the players are experiencing what you dream for them to experience? I really try to um, kind of democratize that narrative power. So yes, um, there is a lot of content that I write that is explicitly GM facing and contains like spoilers for the players. But I do really want to preserve that element of players having like meaningful choice that, that, if that has like cascading effects on the narrative. And I try to flag opportunities for the GM to like leave this decision open to the players, which does mean that a lot of the like adventures that I write um, tend more towards hooks and suggestions and mm -hmm. then are pretty a pretty play to find out. Um, I'm not very prone to um, the style of adventure writing where you present a situation or a problem, all the relevant NPCs, and then um, tell the GM how you expect the players to solve that problem. Sure. And then so that the conclusion. Approach. Right, and then the, the conclusion of the adventure is dependent, as, the conclusion of the adventure as written is dependent upon the players approaching the problem in a certain way. Um, what I am more prone to doing is saying, you know, here's the issue, here are the NPCs that are relevant to the issue, here are some methods the players may take to approach the problem, but there are of course other ways they can approach the problem, and then here is how you know when they have solved it to an extent that you can end the adventure, which may um, may not look like the solution that I am writing towards. It may uh, look, look, look something looks different. So I think um, when I focus on player experience, I try to leave room for problem solving and curiosity and for those really like emergent role play moments that um, are, really hard to capture well when you write expecting players to follow a certain path. Yeah. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, we've been talking about designing outside D&D, &D, designing things that are other than D&D, &D, because we talk a lot about designing for D&D, &D, and I feel like that's that's something that is, as I was saying at the beginning, something that gets the lion's share of attention right now in the RPG space. What for you are the advantages of designing outside of D&D? You can do different things for different types of players, um, I think is like the, the most obvious thing. I will say that D&D is good at what it does. Um, and like, I, um, I appreciate D&D and I enjoy it. Um, that said, I think the biggest advantage of writing outside of D&D is that you can really just with your whole chest say what you want out of a play experience and know that there is a game or a style of play that will get you that experience um, rather than trying to homebrew a combat emulator into something else. Um, I think that D and D is um, like a step removed from like minis and wargaming, and which is where it came from, of course. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it's it's that is like an important niche in the the like ecosystem of of tabletop gaming, and I am glad that we have a product that does that. Um, but I think there are a lot of players who think that they don't like RPGs, but actually just are not interested in that specific experience and have gotten caught on trying to bend D&D &D into creating other experiences when there are entire other games that will give you what you're looking for without having to uh, homebrew yourself to hell and back. Um, so I think the advantage for me is that you get to be very specific and very granular about what you are actually looking for out of gameplay and know that there is something that will out, that will offer you that. 
All right, so I'm going to put you on the spot now. I apologize. And chat, I okay. welcome your response to this question as well. Do you have specific favorite systems you'd recommend for alternative experiences to what D&D offers? Chat, I want to hear what you have to say as well. And uh, yeah, okay. I want to hear about Dominic's favorite, favorite systems, basically. Yeah, I have to say Cypher system because uh, my job. And also, I, it's a great system that... Um, is very genre flexible and the modularity allows you to explore in a lot of different directions. Um, I think what Belonging Outside Belonging does is fantastic and it um, makes room for a kind of storytelling that you probably wouldn't encounter elsewhere if you weren't like super deep in the indie games ecosystem. And I really love for the Queen and Descended from the Queen games, especially if you're looking for a like super casual, low prep experience that I think people more associate with board games, you can just pick it up and play. Um, I think it kind of opens up the world of RPGs to people who don't have the time or the inclination to like put the prep into um, creating you know, the story that they want to tell but also to creating like a group. Um, it can happen very organically. You just have some friends over for dinner and you get out of deck cards. Um, yeah, and I think um, for, I also, I have a soft spot for solo games and journaling games. And I think uh, Princess with the Cursed Sword and all of the, um, the games that use that system are fantastic there as well. Really cool. Well, the chat was going wild. I've got Ars Magica, City of Mists, Hero System. Someone shouted out Star Trek. That is a very fun game. If you want to play Star Trek, Star Trek really feels like Star Trek. Like they have done their job there. It is awesome. Blaze in the Dark as well. So a whole bunch of other names for those of you listening. Oh, I forgot. Um, um, Powered by the Apocalypse. That's like a very basic one. That one's fun. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> You can play like any um, any genre in that pretty much, um, and there are really fun opportunities to um, just pick up your character and port it into a different game or a different context, um, which which I think is, is always like if you just want to change things up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Gaming is supposed to be fun, guys. That's that's we take it very seriously here but i will remind everyone gaming's supposed to be fun if you want to pick up your character and do something cool do it hit the door don't do it <laughs> yeah exactly uh so we've talked about advantages of writing outside of D D, and and they are of course many do you think that for you there are any disadvantages to designing for non D D games so i would have said until about a year or a year and a half ago that you lose out on name recognition and that when people think of RPGs, they think of D&D and that that's like a whole uh, area of the market that you're not really able to reach if people aren't um, prone to seek out other games. But I do think um, in the past year plus, we've seen a lot of movement of people just becoming curious about what else is out there. So yes, there are definitely still people who... Um, are only interested in playing D&D, but there's also like significantly more people who are actively looking to check out new things. Um, so what I would have said was my main disadvantage no longer really feels relevant. So I'm gonna say no, actually. <laughs> nice, nice, I like that. Um, and a question I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, um, you don't just design professionally as a freelance. You also design, uh, you also have a day job in the RPG industry. Um, obviously, those are two different but highly related things. Um, how did you get into designing professionally for RPG publishers? So doing the design work. And how did you get involved with your day job at an RPG company? Um, I feel like they're, yeah. they're two slightly different aspects, so I'd love to treat them separately, if that's okay. They're pretty connected, so this might kind of blur how I'm going to, because I, I will just chronologically go through this, uh, which is that when I was in college, I was very uh, lucky to have an internship at Monty Cook Games, 
Um, nice. That was for the duration of a semester and some change. So I think like five-ish months. And in that time, I um, got to shadow in a lot of different departments from like editorial to design um, to like layout. And I got to identify more of what I am interested in and what I want to do. And also in the course of that internship, I, um, I knew that I really, once I had seen, you know, how a product goes through all of the, the different steps of being produced and created, I, um, I felt like I had gotten to see all of those steps in a very disjointed way because of where different things were in the production cycle. And I wanted the experience of following one thing from start to finish. Um, so I asked basically, you know, can I take what I have learned and write an adventure? And um, will you put it out maybe? <laughs> and um, I was very lucky that everyone was like, uh, yeah, like go write your adventure. We will support you writing it. Uh, we can't guarantee that we'll publish it, but go write it, have a blast you do you. And I wrote the adventure High Sun Miracle 4, which is still available on MCG. And um, it, you know, we got it to a point where Monty Cook Games was able to put it out as a PDF. Um, and I was very proud of it. And that was my first, um, that was the first bit of game design that I had done that was intended for an audience. I think previously I had um, written things to share with my friends um, and written things to play with my home group, but that was my first time writing something that was deliberately um, with an eye towards, towards uh, being shared. Um, and that was a huge turning point for me and like really like changed my life. Um, and then also in the course of my internship, I was very lucky that I went to Big Bad Con in 2019 and um, was able to go to the POC dinner and the POC uh, mixer and that programming track and the work that Ajit George has done with that programming track is um, has been so important to me. Also, I will be there this year. Um, looking forward to it, it'll be great. Um, and in that, uh, in that time, I, um, was able to make a lot of connections with people who I would later go on to work with as a freelancer. And then after my internship ended, um, I was able to kind of make good in all of those contacts that I'd established at Big Bad Con and take on a whole bunch of freelance work, um, which I think that um, freelancing because they're, I mean, internships are great. There are not a lot of them in this space. I think that freelancing and um, pitching in that ecosystem allows uh, newer creators to kind of try on different skills and modalities and find what clicks for them. And that is probably the closest thing that this field has to like an apprenticeship model. Um, so I got to work with a lot of different people doing a lot of different things. I got, you know, to make a lot of like mentorship connections. And I was also very deliberate about just leaving doors open. So I would work with someone and then say like, I would love to do more of X, Y, Z. Let me know if, if you come across anyone who's looking for someone to do that. And um, was just like really aggressive about seeking out opportunities and using those opportunities to get other opportunities. And um, through, I think I, after I left my internship, there was a two year window where I was in school and then working full time somewhere else and freelancing. And in that time I wrote for Thirsty Sword Lesbians for um, Radiant Citadel um, and for Paizo and a bunch of other stuff. And I also uh, crowdfunded and put out a game of my own with, with my, my co-writer, CJ Linton. 
And um, I basically was able to gather enough experience and get to a point where I had the qualifications and the drive that it made sense to pivot to doing this full time. And that allowed me to go back to MCG, which has been like one of the best moves of my life. Um, <laughs> so it, it's been a lot of being in the right place at the right time. The thing that I will say is that um, I'm very grateful for the people who have opened doors for me. I have taken it upon myself to run through those doors and then into the next doors. So I think it, it just takes like one good opportunity, but you do have to be able to leverage that. And once you get, you know, your first freelance gig or, you, or if you're able to get an internship or something similar to really um, be proactive about asking, you know, are you looking for someone to do layout? Are you looking for someone to illustrate? Or, um, you know, do you know someone who's looking for a consultant? I consult in these areas. If you know someone who needs like someone in those areas, please let me know. Um, and from there, I think things kind of build. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, in the UK, I don't know about in, um, in America, but in the UK, this is called a portfolio career. And it's literally made of bringing together pieces and trying to have enough all together to turn it into a whole thing. Um, and it does come piece by piece. Um, any tips for that yeah. first reach out? Obviously, for you, you had uh, the internship, which was a, an amazing opportunity. As you said, there aren't always, always a lot of those about. Um, do you yeah. recommend people, you know, turning up on the doorstep of Monty Cook with a manuscript? <laughs> like, ha ha what? No. Them? OK. Don't worry. Don't worry. I, 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 I am <laughs> deliberately saying this for effect. But uh, do you see what I mean? Yeah. Like, where does that first reach yes. out come from? Yeah, I, I will say that if you are um, able to find freelance opportunities and pitch for them, um, it is much easier to do that if you already have some an example of your work to show. Um, and what I would recommend doing for that is to, you know, on your own independently with no promise of making money off of this, which is a very privileged thing to be able to do. Um, make one good thing that you can just throw yourself behind. That could be like an adventure that you put on drive through, um, but like really, um, really the, like you got the layout, you've got interior art, you get the mechanics where you want them to be. Um, maybe that means like hiring a freelance editor um, or maybe like you you write like a like a, a two page game on itch for a jam and put it up for free. Um, I would say this I was able to do this through my internship because my adventure that I wrote in my internship became this thing for me. But start by making one thing that is the best you're capable of at your current skill level and experience level and throw yourself behind it and make it as absolutely amazing as you have the means to, you will get better. And once you have that, you know, if you're, um, if you're in a position where you meet someone who is looking for uh, designers, like if you're in a networking capacity at a con, or if you're just like on social media, you then you have the, the ability to say, you know, I am looking to take on freelance work in this capacity and here's an example of something that I have made. Um, and I think you really just have to have like one really good thing to show and that will get you in the door. And then once you start, you know, building your portfolio, it kind of snowballs, but um, you really just have to start where you are and make the absolute best thing that you can. <laughs> start by doing the thing. It's kind of what I'm yes. hearing here. Always. Yeah, and it's, it is, a, it is a very privileged position, I think, to be able to say, like, you know, I, I'm going to write, like, a, a one-page game and put it up on itch, but with no guarantee that you'll recoup any costs on it. So, I and I definitely am aware of that. Um, but if you have the ability to do that, that is what I would say to do. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. 
So we've talked a lot about writing for other people. We've talked about freelancing for other people. We've talked about creating in other people's settings with other people's systems. Now we're going to flip it on its head. We're going to talk about creating <laughs> your own games from scratch, your own systems, your own settings. That's where we're driving into. And of course, Dominique has experience in this area as well, because they are completely amazing. So uh, I'm going to start with the same question. Where do you start when creating your own game system and setting? Where does it all begin? So I will say this question is complicated for me because of the number of art forms that I work in. Um, I also do like fiction and other things. So my first question is usually, does it need to be a game? And why does it need to be a game? Um, I, if I have an idea that is kind of in the nebulous early forms of idea-ness, I want to identify what is the best form to express that idea in. And that also requires some honesty that can be uncomfortable. <laughs> Uh, because sometimes you think you want to make a game and it is not a game. Um, for example, Tomorrow in Revelation 3, which I co-wrote with CJ Linton, um, I presented him with the initial idea. And he is also like a very dear friend of mine who has read and edited a lot of my fiction. And when I was talking through the idea with him, um, he was like, that's really cool but that's a story, that's not a game. Um, and we had to take several steps back and figure out how to make it um, playable and how to actually leave room for, uh, for, for people to build narratives within it that were not just the one specific objective that I had. Um, because the way that I would have written it, there is one problem in the setting. And when you solve that problem, there is no more game. <laughs> um, there's one big story and, and that's it. Yeah. yeah. Which that that could have been uh, a short story. It, it it didn't even need to be a novel. It could have been it could have been, you know. But I and then the other side of that for Plant Girl Game, my idea for Plant Girl Game was a graphic novel. And I talked that through uh, with Misha Bushager. And after a a very um it wasn't even a very extensive conversation. It took me like 10 minutes of talking about it. And I was like, oh wait, that's gotta be a game. That's that's not fiction. <laughs> um, so I think my, your, I think um, if you are prone to being, you know, creative in multiple modalities, and I think most people who make art are, um, the first step is always, to um, question your initial assumption of what form the idea is going to be and be really honest about uh, what you want it to be versus what it actually is. Um, and then from there, I think it's like a pretty vibes-based approach. I'm, I, I would say I think about... Um, what do I want the experience of playing it to be? Um, which informs a lot of, you know, mechanics and how mechanics are used. But I generally start with setting um, and then go into character creation. I think character creation is the most concrete way that players, like, initially interact with the world. So I you know, build the setting. And then I think about who is in this setting and what are they doing? And how do I want them to feel about what they're doing? And that allows me to determine like, are there different character types and how are those types distinct from each other? And what are the different play experiences that different types are kind of leaning towards? And then from there, that um, once I kind of have the flavor of the, who your character can be, that's when I'll start thinking about how that's expressed in mechanics and in the character sheet. So, um, you know, you are a farmer working on a space station. Um, okay, what does that look like in stats? And what will you need to roll for? 
what is the kind of situation that you would be put in that would be better served by chance than by um, just organically determining the outcome. Um, and then from there, it kind of uh, is kind of like a, a like a scaffolding approach that that becomes very iterative, where as I'm determining, you know, what the character sheet looks like and what the mechanics are, that will also feed into, you know, what is the role of the GM and how do I recommend approaching GMing this game? And, you know, how many players do I see being at the ideal table? What kind of stories do I see taking place? Um, and there'll be moments where I will like be working on a character type and then we'll think like, oh, this is going to be very important that the GM knows exactly like this piece of information. And then we'll kind of like run ahead and do that and then like come back. Um, so it, it gets very iterative, but it starts with vibes and setting. Okay, I love that. So you start with vibes and the setting and what kind of fun we want to have. And then you think about, okay, how are we creating characters? Who are our people here? And then you yeah. start thinking more about, okay, what kind of fun are these people having in the space? And how are my mechanics supporting that? And how am I supporting the GM in having that kind of fun? This is this is kind of the the, the process I'm hearing. Is that is that kind yes, of Yes, exactly. Close? Yeah. Really cool. At what point, or whoa, what are the processes going from that first iteration? And you said you, you go through several iterations to something that somebody else template test. How do you know when it's ready to put your baby in somebody else's hands and say, play this? So Hashtag. I'm very, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky. Um, I say lucky, I'm not sure where my personality just comes from, but I'm not nearly as precious with games as I am with fiction, where if I'm writing fiction, I'm like, no one can look at it until it is perfect to me. But games, I'm like, you know, there is a lot of benefit from getting eyes on early and often, and I can put aside my anxiety and just throw it at my friends. Um, and I also have a social circle that is uh, pretty chill with that, which I'm grateful Amazing. for. Um, so I try to play test early, um, and frequently, um, I don't always succeed at this, but I feel this is what I do, <laughs> which is that, um, as soon as you have mechanics, you should be play testing those mechanics. Um, even if it's just, you know, getting one other person to sit down and look at dice probability and determine like how swingy is this stat you know yeah. what is the range of outcomes um and if you are rolling 2d6 and success is above a uh, seven what are the odds of ever succeeding with this array of stats um and not all of that looks like you know the the the, the typical ideal of play testing of like we're going to sit down and make characters and run an adventure it can just be um, kind of, you know, it is me and one other person and a notepad and a spreadsheet. Um, but I think that it's really helpful to identify those problems as early as you can and then build accordingly. Um, and then as far as playtesting, like, with a group, my first step is generally going to be character creation. So as soon as I know like what are the types of characters and how are they reflected in the character sheet i that's when i want people to look at the character types and tell me like what do you see here that you are most interested in playing and if you were playing this character um and you like went through character creation what would you want out of subsequent game experience and then make sure that i'm delivering on that and right. then, you know, go and, and write the rest of it or refine the rest of it if it already exists in some form. And then come back and say, now that we've got like the numerical mechanics and the character creation and the world and all that is where I want it to be. Now let's actually make characters sit down and do an adventure. Um, and then from there, leave so much room to scrap entire things, rework entire things. Um, I don't think I've ever had a play test go the way I wanted it to, but they go the way I need them to. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like they, that's an they, important they, distinction. Yeah, they're, um, I think 
you have to uh, really check in with yourself about the the point where something is really frustrating, but also very useful. <laughs> where maybe you're not getting the feedback you wanted because you're not asking the right questions. And maybe the problems that you are trying to solve are not the actual problems. Um, so once you get into like a full table play testing, try to stay very, ask specific questions about what you think the issues might be or what you think might need refining, but stay very open to the possibility that the actual issues that arise in play are things that you have not accounted for at all. Yeah, fair. Okay, this actually brings me on to my next question. Uh, there is a saying, not all books, not every book is for every reader, not every game is for every player. We all like our own things. There are some very famous, important books I have not enjoyed at all. Um, <laughs> and that's okay. That's that's how it is. How early in your design process do you consider who your game is ideal for? And does that affect... <laughs> really interesting. Yeah. Right away, you're, you're thinking about, okay, who's the ideal person who's going to love this thing? Yeah, well, I think that um, my first priority in writing, whether it's, you know, any format, is to entertain myself because I have to spend the most time with it. So necessarily, the players that I'm writing for, if I'm creating a system, are players that share my interest in narrative and play style. And it is impossible for me to separate the experience of writing a game with all of the experiences that inform that of having like played with my friend group over the past like five years. I think um, most of what I write, I write thinking about how I'm going to get my friends to play it with me. <laughs> nice. So <Okay>. immediately. <laughs> so you're really thinking about specific people. Well, I mean, yes, my next yeah. question was going to be, does that affect how you play test? And it sounds like you play test with your friends because they're the ones yeah, who fall I, in love with it. I try to play test uh, with those people uh, and, you know, broaden out from there. So I'll say like, I wrote this thinking that this one friend would really get a kick out of it. Let's see if they're available to play test this. And if not, um, or even if they are in subsequent play tests, let's broaden this out and see like, who else do I know that might have a slightly different uh, narrative approach or who might want slightly different experience. Um, to kind of um, see like the, the tolerance, I guess, um, of like, I wrote this thinking about one specific play experience, but how far outside of that is it still satisfying? And then try to, you know, um, open out more publicly and sometimes I'll do like a Google form and, and get more, more broader feedback or like release an ash can and get broader feedback. But I generally start with like, I know who this is for, and then how far out can I go from that and have it still be the game that I want it to be? Really cool. What do you think makes a compelling RPG game for you? Um, I think space to think about narrative problems in a low stakes way. Um, like problems that may be apparent in your actual life, but that you get to work through in a game context that feels removed from that. Um, but also there's value in like pure escapism. I would never write that off. But I think for me, I want, um, I want to take the things that keep me up at night and find ways to make them feel safe and actionable. So like Tomorrow in Revelation 3 is, um, what if you took the furthest logical extreme of capitalism um, and made the most terrible, awful space station built around that value system? How do you build community and resist that in game? Um, and then Plant Girl Game is about ecological disaster and how do you take like climate disaster and climate uh, refugees and how do you, um, put all of those really large and terrifying issues in a cozy context where you and your siblings who are plant children get to go find solutions. Um, so 
so for me, it's taking the um, the big problems that feel very scary and that I feel powerless in the face of and finding ways to make them feel at least for three hours at a time like I'm doing something. I love that. Tell us a little bit more about um, Plant Girl Game because uh, it is your latest game. It's just come out on Itch, I think. Um, yeah. I just put in the chat where you guys can go and check that out. It is a adorable it is so cute oh, i guys. love it so much just, the... just, i want to squeeze its little <laughs> cheeks tell us a little bit more about about what's the lure there why why should we check it out why should we step into the role of plant children for a plant yeah. mama which is kind of the game right <laughs> yeah you don't have to be a girl you do have to be a plant the plant girl is your mom she's a plant witch who grows plant children in her garden and you and your siblings are uh, learning how to be good stewards of your community and of your environment and having lots of adventures and trying to save the ecosystem for small town. And um, I think the draw for me um, and what I want people to get out of it is that you can uh, play characters who make choices that you have taught yourself not to make because you're playing children and adolescents and you're at that age where um, you, I think, I think I, the, the characters are situated at the age where you become aware of how big some of the problems facing us are, but you have not yet realized why there are so many roadblocks to solving them. Um, I think people talk a lot about the like unique rage of like 15 year old girls. And for me, that is because you are looking around and realizing that like all this shit is awful, but you're also like, there's like the patriarchy and like capitalism and climate change. And why are people so invested in using their resources and power to make the world worse for people and why can't we all just be nice to each other and i think i have situated characters at the age where you start to see the problems but don't see all the barriers to solutions and because of that your characters get to be really chaotic <laughs> um like i've had uh uh play tests where um like there is uh, the mayor of your town is causing all this havoc to your, your local environment. And the way that the character solves this is to kidnap the mayor's dog and uh, hold it for ransom where the ransom is stop polluting our river. Um, <laughs> uh, I think you're, it, it allows you that freedom of being at a point where the problems are big, but the solutions could be simple. And as we get older, we learn that the solutions might feel out of our reach. And I really want to be able to step back to a place where uh, you haven't learned that powerlessness yet. I love that. I think that's amazing. And a second hand samurai says, as a British person, the escapism of being out in the sunshine is a big <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that too. We do have a couple of questions. Um, from our audience, I'm going to pick out the very shiniest ones that I can find because we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, here's one from Bonnie Juju who asks, how do game su systems support or not support different genres? So are there any systems that are particularly good for certain genres, in your opinion? So I will say that, like, I, I think the... Um, the kind of dream of a like one size fits all universal system is in vain with an asterisk. Um, <laughs> I think you are not going to find like one system that is able to do all of the things that you could want it to do. But I do also think that there are um, ways to make small modifications where the same base system is able to support different genres due to like changes that are relatively minor. So when I think about Powered by the Apocalypse, right, you can fit so many different genres and narrative experiences in 
those games by writing new playbooks, by introducing a new setting, and by maybe changing the name of one or two of the stats. But they are all fundamentally the game. Um, and you're able to have like Monster of the Week and Monster Hearts and Crazy Sword Lesbians and a bunch of other things that are the same base system. Similarly, the Cypher system, um, as it's presented in the Cypher system rulebook, is um, it's presented as being able to tackle multiple genres. And it can, but there are also several supplements that go more in depth on you know specific mechanics that are created for different genres. So you might um, have like the main rule book and try to run a superhero campaign with that. And you can do it, but you might not get the full breadth of the experience as if you had the main rule book and Claim the Sky or The Origin where you have like different character creation, you know, rules or different optional modules that can introduce more specificity of genre of what you're looking for. Um, so I think that kind of, my answer is that um, you're not gonna find, well, I don't think, I could be wrong, I'm willing to be proven wrong, but I don't think you will find a system that does everything, but I think you can find a system that leaves enough potential for modularity that you can then within that overarching system get specific about what you're looking for. One of the things that we were talking about before we went live uh, is the fact that, um, first of all, I'm obsessed with Wolfgang Bauer. Everybody here knows it. He's amazing. Uh, I am a massive fan of his uh, Cobalt Guide to Game Design. Uh, in case anybody's looking for good resources on how to start designing games, it is very, very fine. I do recommend it. And one of the things that he says in one of his essays in there is that um, if something is important in a game, the system should underpin it. So if you are playing, playing science fantasy and there is a specific kind of magic system that, that is causing a specific kind of thing, your system has to underpin it. If you are playing Jane Austen style parlor intrigue, you need a mechanic to help you with that. Maybe it's a it's a blush mechanic or a shame mechanic or a Mr. <laughs> Darcy mechanic. I don't know. I haven't made the game. But touching need... hands mechanic. Yes, exactly. Or not touching hands. Um, <laughs> or, or whatever it is. A dancing mechanic that raises your prestige within the group because you know, any savage can dance. Anyway, I don't know. But like there should be something in the rules that is helping you and underpinning that fun, in my opinion, because that's what kind of holds that fun in the game. That's what makes the players yes. and the GMs go, oh, look, this is important. We should be doing this. That's part of this game. For me, that's how you reach through the GM to your players and say, this is the kind of fun we're having. And then you don't end up with Jane Austen Kaiju by mistake because you didn't put the, the thing in, which, by the way, I won. Yeah, wait, that might be an accident, but not to me. I would do that on purpose. I want that. <laughs> All right. All right, you've heard it here first. We're teaming up. We're writing Jane Austen <laughs> Kaiju. Powered by the apocalypse. It's coming with a, a not touching hands and a Mr. Darcy mechanic. <laughs> yes, it's happening, guys. <laughs> Today on um, the projects I don't have time to write, but dear God, I wish I could. Oh, did. absolutely. I'm <laughs> so busy right now. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have a question from Tillers, which is essentially, do you find it easier to write if you have more freedom? Or do you find it easy to write if you have lots of law and background to support you? What is your personal preference? I think it depends on what exactly I'm writing. So if I'm writing an adventure and I have like totally open freedom of the setting, as long as it is for you know the game and using the game mechanics, um, I would prefer that. Um, I think an example of that would be like for Radiant Against Citadel, um, we were given, you know, the overarching framework of how these different locations connect, but still got to create our own place and our own adventure. And that was amazing. I don't think I would have enjoyed it as much if I had just written the adventure and someone else had done like the gazetteer. Um, but I think if I am doing like NPCs or like player character options um, for that, I would want lots of lore because my approach for that would be to 
look at the background information and how it ties into existing assets in the game and see um, where is there room to dig deeper? What are things that are not being used that already exist? And then that's where I would situate whatever I'm creating. And um, I think it creates a richer and more cohesive game experience on the whole, but it also saves me a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dominique, thank you so much for joining us. You have been an absolute pleasure and a mine of information. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Hey, you, you can come back then. I've had so much fun. It's been <laughs> awesome. You just tell me. Thank I want to come back and talk about something. Dominique, you're coming back. <laughs> that is, uh, yeah, I think we're there. I think there's only one more thing to say. I think you must light up the fort.